take your Bible this evening, if you would, go to Psalm 9, the ninth Psalm, if you would, please. And just two verses I want to read tonight, and then, of course, we'll be turning to others uh, throughout our study, but we'll start here in Psalm 9. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Let's pray together. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture tonight. And Lord, as we uh, look at this admonition and this encouragement to us, I pray, Lord, that each of us would take it to heart. And we would determine tonight that we will be doers of the word and not hearers only. And so, Lord, grip our hearts tonight with this truth. And I pray that each of us would obey and be glad. Thank you that you have made us glad. And I pray that you'd use your word tonight and Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. Be the teacher for your people this evening. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Well, the Christian ought to be glad. And you might be glad. I'm not talking about being be patient. Uh, could have had part three on that tonight. But you're probably thankful that's not the case. But you can be glad. What's it mean to be glad? Well, it means to be pleased. It means to be uh, affected with pleasure or, or joy. It means to be happy. We, we use terms like cheerful or joyous. Uh, over and over in the Psalms, if you have your Bible open at Psalm 9, uh, let's look through those scriptures. I think I put them on your paper. Uh, Psalm 32 and verse 11. Psalm 32 and verse 11. The Bible says this, uh, Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Uh, you know, uh, one week from tomorrow night, there'll be people shouting at the television set because Ohio State opens against Indiana on Thursday night, okay? And uh, they won't have any problem shouting for the Buckeyes. Have you ever shouted for God? Have you ever shouted for the Lord? You ever got excited about God and the things of God? Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. Shout for joy. Uh, look at Psalm 40 and verse number 16. Psalm 40 and verse number 16. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. Again, be glad in thee. Look at Psalm 64 and verse 10. Psalm 64 and verse number 10. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and shall trust in Him. And all the upright in heart shall glory. Again, the, the psalmist reminding us to be glad in the Lord. Now, by the way, if God had to remind us this many times, we must struggle with this. Does that make sense? Uh, this must be something that we may have a difficult time with. And, and sometimes we, we tend to be sad instead of glad. And we tend to get under the circumstances instead of on top of the circumstances. And, and uh, old Dr. Tom Malone, one time, I remember him saying, he'd, every time he asked a woman in his church how she was doing, she would always say, well, I'm okay under the circumstances. How you doing today, Miss so -so? Well, I'm all right under the circumstances. And finally he had enough. And one day when she said that, he looked at her and he said, well, what are you doing under there? Get on top of those circumstances, amen? Be glad in the Lord. And then Psalm 68 and verse number 3. Psalm 68 and verse 3. Notice he says, but let the righteous, do what church? Be glad and let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Be glad. Uh, you know, are you, are you glad to be a Christian? Are you glad to be saved? Oh, yeah, to bring joy and delight to your heart. I read where Holiday Inn was trying to fill, uh, get 500 people to fill positions for their uh, new facility, and they interviewed 5,000 candidates. And the reason they interviewed 5,000 candidates was they were all hotel managers, they're interviewing people, 
And they had to exclude any candidate who smiled any less than four times during the interview. If they weren't a happy camper and they didn't smile at least four times, they were disqualified from being considered for the job. How about that? I wonder how many of you would have got the job. <laughs> An old man was asked what robbed him of the joy, what robbed him of joy the most in his life. You know what he said? The things that never happened. The things that never happened. Most of the things we worry about that take away our gladness, that take away our joy, never happen. We worried about nothing. Someone cited three keys to happiness or three keys to being glad. Number one is fret not. Fret not. You know why? God loves you. God loves you. No need to fret. Number two, faint not. Why, why don't you faint? Because he holds us up. Underneath are the everlasting arms. And he holds us up. The third thing is fear not. Because he keeps us. And he that keeps us never slumbers or sleeps. He's always on the job. Songwriters have captured it. Oh, say, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Jesus has come and my cup's overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. How about when I am sad, to Him I go. No other friend can cheer me so. When I am sad, He makes me glad. He's my friend. Jesus means all the world to me. Jesus may come today. Glad day, glad day, and I would see my friend. Troubles and trials would end if Jesus would come today. All through the book, you'll find songs about gladness. So if you would study the word glad or gladness, you'd find that used over 139 times in the Bible. We won't look at all those scriptures tonight. Don't, don't get excited, all right? But there are cousins, if you were, or uh, uh, <laughs> relatives of the word gladness, like joy and happiness and those type things. And uh, you can find many mentions of those words in the Bible. That God expects us not just to have joy or to have gladness, but to be glad. It's, what, it's not something we're doing, it's something we are. It's, it's, it's being glad. And so it's part of our being, it's our attitude that we carry with us all the time. And so, it's, and by the way, if you're going to be glad and you're going to have the positive attitude, you're going to be that way in this world, it's going to be on purpose. Because most of what you hear and most of what you see is negative. It's downer. I mean, the news is negative. Uh, I, I've talked to numbers of people, and you know what they tell me? They, they tell me how much better off they are since they stopped watching the news. Huh? Is there, is there people like that here tonight? Yeah, you said, you know what? I just got me discouraged and negative and just, uh, j just a poor attitude. I just said, forget that stuff. I'm not going to listen to it anymore. It's, it's sad how, how negative news seems to be the thing that everybody pushes. But that's where we are. But there's a, there ought to be something different about a believer. A believer ought to be glad. Amen? Well, that's several things I want to share with you about being glad. The first thing is, a Christian ought to be glad because of his salvation. Amen? Isaiah 25. If you turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, notice with me, verse number 9. Isaiah 25, verse 9. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. Now this is Israel waiting for the deliverance of the Lord. I think we can apply it to you and me. That we can rejoice in His salvation. Uh, it's, it's what He has done for us, not what we've done for ourselves. Amen? Nobody, nobody is saved by what you did for yourself. You're saved by what Jesus Christ has done for you, and it's His salvation. How should we neglect, how should we escape if we neglect so great salvation that's been given to us? Psalm 144, 
Verse 15 says, Happy is the people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Oh, I remember when folks got saved in the little church I was in. As I was just a young boy. Uh, they, people got saved. The, the congregation would sing, Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. And they sung what a happy day it was. I don't know about you. Nobody's saved by feeling. But when you get saved, you get a feeling. I'll guarantee it. I, I felt a load lifted off me, and I just felt lighter. It seemed like the grass was greener, the sun was brighter. It just seemed like everything was different when I got saved. Uh, it should be that way for you. And it's a great thing to be saved. It's just, it, think of the, the un, unreached people groups on that prayer list and think, you know, just think about that. You were in a place where you heard the gospel. And you can say tonight, you're saved. You can sing like we do often at church, saved by His power divine, saved to new life sublime. Last Wednesday night, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Man, can you know that, that most of this world can't say their name's written down in heaven? But you can? Man, you ought to be glad about that. We ought to be glad about our salvation. The rich young ruler who came to Jesus in Matthew 19. You remember? And Jesus had told him, well, what you need to do, you're trusting in your riches. You need to sell all you have and give to the poor and come follow me. And that rich man said, that, 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 that rich ruler said, that's too much for me. And the Bible says he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. You'll never ever read anybody that received Jesus and went away sorrowful. They always went away rejoicing. In fact, Zacchaeus, come down. Uh, today I'm coming to your house. And, and when he came to Zacchaeus' house, he said, Zacchaeus received him joyfully. Oh, he was glad. He was happy to receive Christ. And, and happy to know Jesus as his Savior. Joy. The joy of salvation. Judas betrayed Christ. How'd that end up for him? Yeah, went out and hung himself, didn't he? went out and took his life. When the two were on the road to Emmaus, to Emmaus and Christ was talking to them and they didn't realize it was the resurrected Christ. Remember when, when he finally revealed himself to them and they talked to each other and Jesus was gone, they said, didn't our heart burn within us while he talked to us on the way? Man, wasn't there something going on inside of you when Jesus talked to us? Can you imagine uh, having Jesus explain the Word of God to you? When, when, the, when the disciples were sent out, the 70 were sent out, and they came back, remember, in Luke chapter 10, and they're rejoicing that, hey, the, 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 the devils were subject unto us. And Jesus said, man, I saw Satan fall from heaven. He said, don't you rejoice in that. What did he tell them to rejoice about? That your names are written down in heaven. You know what? You can be glad about that because that never changes. That is His salvation. If it was my salvation, I could lose it. But it's not mine, it's His. And He gave it. I'm kept by His power. Not by my power. Or I'd be in bad shape. So would you. I'm, we sing on Sunday morning. How do we close the service? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Yeah, are you really? Huh? Uh, Why well, I've been washed by the fountain. I've been cleansed by His blood. That's how you get part of the family of God. I'm glad I am saved. Man, I'm glad I'm saved. I don't know how people live who aren't saved. I don't know how they get by. I don't know what they live for. I don't know what they do. It's, it, 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 it's nothing like being saved. Amen? So be glad I'm saved. Number two, look at Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Are you all right? Psalm 118. You, you've heard this one. You've seen this one. Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I know, you sing that song. This is the day. This is, you know. And, uh, but listen, this, I'm glad. I can be glad, number two on your paper, is because God is in control. God is sovereign. This is the day who made? The Lord hath made. The Lord makes the day. 
And so it's, it's the day, today's the day then, that I'm to rejoice and be glad. So if God made the day and He told me I'm supposed to be glad in the day He made, then i got to trust He gave me just the day He wanted me to have. Okay? And I can be glad about that. So it's a day to forget the worries and be glad in the Lord. It's a day not to be wasted in worrying about food or money or tomorrow or yesterday. It's not a time to, 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 to be concerned about those things. It's a time to rejoice. It's a time to be glad about today. Why? God gave me another day. God just authored another day for me. I might not be feeling well physically, financially, spiritually, mentally, or any other way. But I'm just going to stop for a moment and say, wait a minute, just hold on. This is the day the Lord hath made. This is a brand new day that God has given to me, and I'm to rejoice in it. There's problems or no problems. Today's the day God's given to me. Feel good or feel bad, this is the day that God has given to me. I don't care if I feel unloved or unrecognized, unimportant or unworthy, or any other uns you can think of. Uh, I, this is the day God has given to me. I'm going to rejoice. This is the day to be happy and to thank God. If I'm not going to do it today, what day am I going to do it? Does the verse say, this is the day? Huh? You, you would tell somebody about salvation. Would you tell them, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. You wouldn't tell somebody, well, it's okay. Just put it off and wait a while. It's all right. You wouldn't tell somebody that about salvation. Well, why do you tell ourselves, to, it's okay. You can be grumpy today. You, you are just having a bad day. Well, what, what happened to Psalm 118, verse 24? This is the day the Lord hath made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hmm? Wow, that's something to put up on your mirror in the morning, I guess, isn't it? That means even though past days have not been good, today I'll rejoice and be happy. It means even though my bank account may be empty, I will still be glad in the Lord today. Even though I know there's bills to be paid, I'll be glad in the Lord today. I'll not forget that this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Don't carry over worry. Don't, don't, don't carry over distress. Don't carry over discouragement. Live each day and be glad in it. That's what he's commanding us to do, isn't he? This is the day. I'll do better tomorrow. Well, what about today? Well, I'm just having a bad week. What? Huh? Hey, this is the day. Every 24 hours, every 1,440 minutes, God gives us a brand new start. God gives us an opportunity to start fresh and anew. It's, it's, a, it's an unbelievable opportunity. And so this is... The day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This day. This day. Remember the fella in the New Testament? I think it's over in Luke 12. That rich guy who had said, I don't know what I do with all my stuff. I'm going to have to tear down these barns and build bigger ones. I got so much them as I just can't keep it all. And then I'm not sure what I'll do after that. And God said, thou fool. This day thy soul shall be required of thee. What was he doing? He was living all about the future and he forgot about today. What about today? What about today? This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And so each day is a gift from God. Be glad because he gives the days. He gives the days. You know, he told Israel in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, he said, as your days, so shall your strength be. Notice, why, notice the order it comes in. The day comes first and then God gives the strength. We want the other way around, don't we? I want the strength first and then God can give me the day I've got to have. God says, no, the day comes first and then I give you the strength. But he promises, as your day, so your strength be. So, why shouldn't I be glad? Why shouldn't I be cheerful? Why shouldn't I be rejoicing? Why shouldn't you be glad 
because of his sovereignty. He's in control. He's in control. God is in control of our days. Is God in charge of your life or not? Did God just save you and say, okay, man, do the best you can? Huh? No, of course he didn't. He did not. Number three. Number three. Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. When I go to Luke 15, what do you think about? You have no idea. Good. Bible students here. Luke 15. Three lost things in Luke 15. Do you remember that? Uh, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. I'm going to be glad, number three, because he welcomes the backslider. He welcomes home the sinner. Amen? Luke 15, notice verse 32. This is the last verse of the chapter where he kind of wraps up the story of the prodigal son and the older brother. And the father's talking to the older brother. And he said, verse 32, it was meet or it was right that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. Boy, that, you remember the story, the story that took place? The, the, the younger of the two sons said, I'm, I'm tired of living by these rules, Dad. I want to get out of here. I know what I'm doing. Give me my money now. Give me my inheritance now. And he took his money. Father gave it to him. He left home. And he lived it up for a while. He, he, he spent it in, in, he wasted his substance. And that's what the word prodigal means. It means wasteful. And he just blew it. And it wasn't long till the money ran out. I was reading this week about a, a fellow who had been drafted into the NBA, played three years in the NBA, then he spent a year in Japan and a couple other smaller leagues, and over the total of five years, he made over $20 million. And now Brother Taylor, at the age of 27, they found out they foreclosed on his home that he had because he hadn't made a mortgage payment in two years. He's bankrupt. He burned through $20 million in five years. Oh, there's been others done better than him. You see, it, it, it just wasteful. Wasteful. Say, boy, that, oh, preacher, that lottery is just $700 million. Hmm? That yeah, might be the worst thing that ever happened to you. Hmm? There have been lottery winners that have said, that's the worst day of my life. Say, so, oh boy, I'd take care of that. If you're not taking care of the $700 you have now, you won't take care of the $700 million if you get it. Boy, that's quiet. Hmm? If you're not taking care of the $7 you have now, you wouldn't take care of the $700 million that God gave it to you. By the way, I won't win because I don't play. Just in case you're wondering. But the man, the, the prodigal wasted it. And you know the story ended up working for the pig farmer. Slopping the hogs. And the hog slop was looking pretty good to him. And then he's thinking, you know, the servants who work back at the farm, they got it better than I do. And I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to tell him that I've sinned against him and just, be, just make me one of the hired servants. I'll, I'll still be better off. I'm sure he rehearsed that speech as he started his way home. He hardly, he hardly got on the trail leading back to the farm when Dad saw him and Dad came running, didn't he? And Dad ran and met him and fell on his neck and began to kiss him, hug him, and, and he hardly got out what he wanted to say. Can I tell you what the Dad didn't say? The dad didn't say, hope you learned your lesson. The dad didn't say, I told you so. At least not that's recorded for us. Hmm? Can I help you with something? When someone comes back to God, having been away from God, having made some mistakes, you know the last thing they need is for you to come up and say, yeah, I told you that would happen. Amen. Last thing they need is for you to come up and say, yeah, I, I, I told you so. No, 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 don't, don't do that. You know what they need? They need somebody to throw their arms around their neck and give them a hug and say, welcome home. Good to see you back. We see it with the RU program all the time. Somebody be gone for a while and we don't see them and all of a sudden they'll show up on a Friday night. 
You know what they get? They get a handshake or a hug and say, welcome back. Good to see you. Do you know what they don't need? Where you been? What have you been doing? Huh? You know what they should say? None of your business. None of, none of my business. I'm glad they're home. Hey, Father just said, hey, son, come on. Hey, get the, get, get the best robe and put it on him and get the ring and put it on his finger. Get that fatted calf, man. We're having a party tonight. That's in the Greek. You've got to get that deep to get that. <laughs> He's happy. He says, my, my boy that was dead is alive again. They begin to marry. Now, now the older son, he, was, he wasn't happy. He was not happy. Can you imagine that? He, here's a guy who, who, who tried to say, I did everything you always did, Dad. He was all about uh, the letter of the law. Doing everything he was supposed to do. Yet he couldn't be happy that someone was coming back and getting right with God, getting right with his father. There are Christians like that. There are Christians like that. There are some Christians who don't want to, if some Christian is messed up or some Christians fallen by the wayside and they, they come back and they want to get right with God and serve God, there's some Christians who say, well, I don't think they ought to be doing anything. I don't think you ought to let them do anything in the church. Really? Be careful, older brother. At that pharisaical attitude. There are really two prodigals here in this story. It wasn't just the one who went away. It was the one who stayed home too. And, and didn't, didn't have the heart of the Father to, to want. You know what? I was talking to somebody about this this week. And, you know, you, you, you shouldn't want to wish evil or bad to anyone. I don't, you know, there are, I spent, we spent eight years under the former president whom I did not vote for. And I did not agree with his policies. And I think he did much to hurt our country. But I do not wish bad for him. I, I do not wish bad for his family. I, 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 don't, I don't want to do that. And in fact, God says in Proverbs 25, not to be glad when your enemy stumbles. Not to rejoice when your enemy falls because God's watching. See, that's not, I don't want to cultivate that kind of a spirit. Uh, I hope something bad happens to that guy. No, don't, don't, don't be that way. Doesn't matter what they've done. Doesn't matter how, how far away they've gone. Wish to, you know, love hopes for the best. Always. Hope for the best for everybody. And so, I'm glad that, hey, I'm glad God receives backsliders. I'm glad that when we, we, we go astray and we mess up and we come to our senses as the prodigal did and we say, I've sinned against God, I've sinned against heaven and we ask God to forgive us, I'm so glad God forgives us. Aren't you? If you've never been there, I, I, I almost guarantee you, you will be. And if you've been saved very long, you, you, you should know what I'm talking about. Thank God. I'm glad because of his salvation. I'm glad because he's in control, his sovereignty. I'm glad because he, he welcomes the sinner home, the prodigal from home. I'm glad because, number four, God is merciful. Boy, is this good. Look at Psalm 90, will you please? The 90th Psalm. God is merciful. And this is all through the Scripture. We could, we could spend an hour just looking at Scriptures on mercy, but we'll just take a few of these. Notice he says in Psalm 90 and verse 14, O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. David says, you know, I want, I want that mercy early so I can enjoy it my whole life. <laughs> Isn't that good? And mercy, what's mercy? That benevolence, mildness, or tenderness of heart, which, which allows a person to overlook injuries, or treat an offender better than he deserves. Mercy. Mercy is when we do not get what we deserve. How many will agree God's merciful to us? <laughs> 
all the time. You ever, when you were a kid, did you ever, did you ever play with another kid grabbing their hand and, you know, and you play mercy? Huh? You twist their hand back and they're twisting yours and, you know, you, you try to break their fingers until somebody says mercy. Huh? Did everybody ever do that? And uh, that was a great game, man. And, uh, yeah, that was a great game. We played it all the time. It was wonderful. Um, not getting the punishment that we deserve. Let me tell you a story. In the middle of the Great Depression, the mayor of New York City, Fiorello LaGuardia, the airport's named after him, he strived to live with the people. You imagine this? It, it was not unusual for the mayor to ride with firefighters, raid with the police, or take field trips with orphans. On a bitterly cold night in January 1935, Mayor LaGuardia turned up at night court serving the poorest ward of the city. He dismissed the judge for the evening and took over the bench himself. Within a few minutes, a tattered old woman was brought before him, charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told the mayor that her daughter's husband had left. Her daughter was sick and her two grandchildren were starving. However, the shopkeeper from whom the bread was stolen refused to drop the charges. It's a real bad neighborhood, Your Honor. She's got to be punished to teach other people around here a lesson. LaGuardia sighed. He turned to the woman and he said, Well, I've got to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. But the mayor was already reaching into his pocket. He extracted a bill and tossed it into his famous hat, saying, here's the $10 fine which I now remit. And furthermore, I'm going to fine everyone in this courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so her grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. The following day, the New York City newspapers reported that $47.50 was turned over to a bewildered woman who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren. Fifty cents of that amount was contributed by the grocery store owner himself. <laughs> While some 70 petty criminals, people with traffic violations, and New York City policemen, each of whom just paid 50 cents, for the privilege of doing so, gave the mayor a standing ovation. You know, that's mercy. Micah 6.8 says we're supposed to love mercy. We're supposed to love not giving people what they deserve. We're supposed to love mercy. How many of you, how many of you know that doesn't come natural? Hmm? And you, you just drive in Columbus for a day, and you know that doesn't come natural. So that guy. Huh? Well, how do you... Hebrews 4.16, Let us come boldly. Let us ever come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain and find grace to help in time of need. What are we coming to obtain? Mercy. Mercy. Why? God has plenty. You know what's great about it? He'll share it. He'll let you and me have some. We get it from Him. And, and so when I'm not very merciful, it shows I've not been around God very much. It shows. When I'm merciful, it's because I've gone to the throne of grace to get mercy. Now, grace is giving people what they don't deserve. Mercy is not giving them what they deserve. Grace is giving them something they do not deserve. Late in the 1800s, and there's an English evangelist named Henry Morehouse, and he made several trips over here to America to preach, and on one of those occasions he was walking through a poor section of town when he noticed a small boy coming out of a store with a pitcher of milk in his hands. But just then he saw the little boy slip and fall breaking the pitcher and spilling milk all over the sidewalk. Morehouse rushed over to the child's side and found him unhurt but terrified. My mama's going to whoop me. My mama's going to whoop me. He kept crying. So 
Morehouse picked the boy up, carried him to the nearby store. He purchased a new pitcher. He returned to the dairy, had the pitcher washed and filled with milk, and with that he carried the boy and the pitcher home. And putting the youngster down on his front porch, Morehouse handed the pitcher to the little boy and said, Will your mama whip you now? And a wide smile came across the boy's tear-stained face, and he said, No, sir, because this is a lot better pitcher than we had before. <laughs> you know what that is? That's grace. That's grace. Giving him what he didn't deserve. That's grace. You know, you know what God does? God doesn't just patch up our shattered lives and our wrecked lives and our sinful lives. You know what He does? He, he, he makes us a new creature. Amen. Completely new. He's a new creation. Create, when you create something, you make it out of nothing. When God saves us, we're new creatures in Him. Old things are? All things are become new. And the next phrase of that next verse says, and all things are of? God. Hey, you're a new creature in Christ. Old things are gone. God started all over when He saved your soul. That's why we don't stand up at Reformers Jam and say, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm an addict or I'm this or I'm a drunk or I'm this. You know why? Because that's not who you are. You're a new creature in Jesus Christ. You're a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. We are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Well, that's a whole message in itself, isn't it? Mercy. Thank God for His mercy. Well, number five. We'll be glad because one day we will be with Jesus. Look at Revelation 19.7. Revelation 19.7. The scene here is heaven, by the way. And the Bible says in verse 7, Let us... Let us what? Be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and His wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And He saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. The Lamb, of course, is Jesus Christ. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The bride. Who's the bride? That's the church. Those of us who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior during the church age. Who are the guests? Who are the ones who are called to the wedding? Let me tell you this. The Old Testament saints. Those who are... And it doesn't mean they're lesser you know, believers and we are, they're just not the bride. Where the church is the bride. They'll be the guests at the wedding. John the Baptist talks about that in John chapter 3 and verse 29. They're the friends of the bride, the, 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 the bridegroom. Jacob, Moses, David, all of them believed in God, but they're not the bride. They're friends of the bridegroom. And they'll be there. We're his bride. Now, in ancient times, in Bible times, marriage was different than it was today. It really was a, 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 a great celebratory event. It was a great social event, and it wasn't just a, a, a one-day deal. Okay? There are several stages that it would go through. First, there was a betrothal or betrothal or an engagement we would use, uh, that word. That's why uh, Joseph was and Mary was betrothed to him. They were like engaged to be married, okay? That, was, that, that usually was arranged and set by the parents. When, when Abraham took Eleazar and said, you go back to our people and you find a wife for Isaac, okay? Isaac didn't have any say in the matter. That's just the way they did it. And uh, parents set it up and arranged it. It was that, that engagement was legally binding and could only be broken by divorce. So it was just as if they were married. Second, second part of that stage, the second stage would be the presentation. 
which was a, a time of celebrations. That would be festivities, parties, if you will, that could last up to a week and sometimes more. Finally, the third phase or the third stage would be the wedding ceremony itself where the vows would be exchanged. Notice verse number 8 said that unto her, that's the bride, that's us, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. And just to make sure that we know what that is, that's the righteousness of the saints. You understand that righteousness is not our right. It's not our righteousness. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ given to us. It's the it's the our all our righteousnesses were as filthy rags in the sight of God. But when you get saved, you take off those filthy rags and you get to put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then God sees you tonight. God sees me tonight, just as righteous as Jesus Christ was. That's the only way we get in. We were, we're dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. And you know, we're going we're gonna to be with Him. And you know what's great? First Thessalonians tells us, when the Lord comes and we rise to meet Him, so shall we ever be with the Lord. We'll always be with Him. There'll never be any more separation. What a day that'll be. Won't that be something? And by the way, that's what, that's what we're living for. I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I just had somebody this week, Brother Bob, say it to me again. Somebody asked me how I'm doing. I said, I'm doing fine. I said, how are you? They said, well, I got up on the the grassy side or whatever what what do you say above the grass or something like that so I guess I'm doing all right and you know I'm saying I didn't wake up six feet under is I guess what they're saying but wait a minute is that true for a Christian huh I mean for a believer I guess I, and I'm trying to think of a good comeback brother Neil I'm gonna come up with something I'm gonna say something like well I'd have been better off if I woke up dead I don't know how you wake up dead but I why? You know why? Absent from the body and present with the Lord. You say, I mean, then don't, don't say, oh, that's too bad he died. No, hallelujah, he died. I know some of you would say that anyway, but I mean, it, hallelujah, that why he's in heaven. I'm with Jesus. That's what I'm living for. That's what this is all about, isn't it? And why are we saying, oh, well, you know, I woke up here, I, I didn't die. Well, too bad for you. If you're going to heaven, you say what you're saying is, man, I'm sure glad I woke up on earth and didn't wake up in heaven. Really? You think anybody who's there would want to come back down here for another day? Not on your life. Not on your life. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Hey, be glad. Be glad. He hath made me glad. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. Let's be glad Christians. Amen? Let's not be sad Christians or mad Christians. Let's be glad Christians. And let's rejoice in the Lord. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the clear teaching of Scripture and your admonition to us to be glad and rejoice in you. Forgive us, God, for so often we get under those circumstances like that woman did in Tom Malone's church. And we kind of walk around with our kicking our chin while we walk. Lord, forgive us for oftentimes being pretty poor advertisements to a lost world of what it is to be a Christian. Lord, may we focus on these words tonight. Be glad. Be glad and rejoice. We're saved. You're in control of our lives. You give us the days that we have. You give us the air we breathe. You give us the life that we have. Father, you welcome us back when we stray from you. You welcome us back when we backslid. Father, you're so good to us. You're so merciful to us. 
so often you don't give us what we deserve. In fact, in grace, you give us so much more that we don't deserve. Lord, we love you. We're looking forward to when we hear the trumpet sound, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. We rise to meet you in the air. Lord, we're, we're listening for the sounds, looking for you to come so we can ever be with the Lord. Until then, help us to be glad and rejoice in you. And we'll thank you for it. Dismiss us now with your care, God. Make us mindful you go with us out of this place. And Lord, help us to please you now in all we do and say. May others see Christ in us this week. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, the windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. 128 in the book if you need it. Let's sing that together. Ready? The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. Watch it. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir, come right on up.